Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Darwinian Delusions. And I have a special guest for you. You probably already recognized him, Sheikh Fadl Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi So, firstly, how are you doing under this lockdown? Perfect. Alhamdulillah. I'm doing well. I'm actually enjoying it. It's like okay. I'm in solitary confinement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, but actually, it made me focus more on uh, on myself. And you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said, "The one who wants to learn about his Lord should learn about himself." Yes, Subhanallah. Yes, so I'm learning about myself, and I'm focusing more on the Quran. Today is my 29th khatira. I do a daily khatira about tadabbur. We just nice. finished two days ago tadabbur surah Yunus pondering upon Yunus, and we started Hud. And inshallah, we decided to continue like that, even if the lockdown is over, but we will continue it. Will, with this rate, we will finish the whole Quran within 12 years and a half, inshallah. Excellent, excellent. That's really great to hear, and good to see you in high spirits. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Um, of course, uh, the Sheikh doesn't need any in, uh, formal introduction, but I wanted to do this because obviously we have some people watching who are new to the channel. So Sheikh Fadl Suleiman is a member of the International Union of Muslim Scholars. He's a consultant of the International Union, Union of Al-Azhar Scholars. He's given talks at many prestigious universities, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on. Many TV channels. And he is a well-known figure in the Arab world when it comes to dealing with atheism. And also he is a translator of the 10 Qiraat of the Quran into the English language. So before I finish the formal introduction, I want to do, uh, do my own introduction, which is many, many years ago when I was very new to Islam, um, I came across one of your videos in which you were talking about um, Anthony Flew, who was the atheist, who became a theist, and you had it in the Arabic language. And this was many, many years ago. I was very new to Islam. So I, the first question I want to put to you, Sheikh, is why would someone like you with a background in these many different Islamic sciences and with all of this prestigious uh, certification that you have, delve into the deep world, the dark world of refuting atheism? Why would you put yourself through that? Alhamdulillah, all praises are due to Allah, the creator, the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe. And may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his descendants and his companions and his followers. First of all, thank you very much for the invite. <coughs> Second, you refreshed my mind and you took me back like 30 years ago when I first, 32 years ago, when I started learning about my religion. I am someone, by the way, who wasn't religious until the age of 22 and 23. Wow, quite late. Yeah. I started learning Tilawa at the age of 22. Excellent. And um, um, I went to uh, a very famous scholar of Islam, a very great one, and also controversial, the Boy. And I told him that I want to learn my religion and I want to learn under you. Okay. He used to come to Egypt once a year. Uh, for a month or something. So he said, I don't have much time to speak with you. So what yep. I will do is that I will suggest some titles. So yep. you go and you buy these books and you read them and then we discuss them together. Fine. Excellent. He gave me a list of books and one of them, he, he told me, it is the best book ever written in Aqidah. Aqidah means creed. Yes. And it is called Qistatul Iman Bain al falsafa wal Ilm wal Quran, the story of faith between religion, uh, between uh, faith, science, and uh, and philosophy. Yeah. Written by a, a Lebanese sheikh who died 60 years ago called Nadim al Jis. Yes. So I, thought, I started to look for that book. I didn't find it anywhere. <laughs> so I found it used, sold for a quarter, a quarter of a pound in the street a used book and i got it and opening it i found that it is proving the existence of god what's that so i went back to the sheikh next week and i said well i bought the books and i finally found one of them which was very rare but sheikh what's wrong why are you giving me that book did i tell you that i'm an atheist or something 
I am a Muslim young man and I am a part of the movement of Islamic movement and I want to learn my religion. He said, from here we start. Don't accept the inherited faith. Yes, you inherited Islam, continue uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, praying, but at the same time, you have to reach the decision that you want to become a Muslim through Burhan, through yes, proof. proof, through yes. evidence. Yes. And that was the start. So actually, mm -hmm. every Muslim should know how, how, yani, why is there a God? Yeah. You know the proof of the existence yes. of God. Yeah. And then if there is a God, is he wise or not? Yes, wise. Yes. Okay, then if he's wise, then it's not wise to create us and leave us. Yes, absolutely. And since he will communicate with us, then this proves the necessity of religion, which is the communication channel between yes. us and God. How will you communicate yeah. with us? Through emails, through SMS messages. Sometimes we're out of reach. So maybe mm -hmm. the best way is to choose one of us and give him a book and tell him, don't go out, uh, uh, don't go off topic. Yes. That's exactly what happened in every era. Yes, absolutely. So it, it all started with me like that. And then, of course, we know that. We're not going to deny that. In the recent uh, 20 years, maybe, uh, uh, atheism started to appear as a wave that people can recognize it yes. in the Arab world. And at that time, I started Bridges Foundation, which was focusing on explaining Islam to non-Muslims and training Muslim public speakers and presenters. Absolutely. Now, but I was approached by people who are telling me, my son left Islam, my daughter left Islam. Can you sit yeah. with them? And from yeah. here it started, sitting and giving yeah. So I had to even delve more and study more about it and, and start to give counseling sessions. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I, I want to sort of uh, pick your brain on this. So I was in Egypt not too long ago, just a few months ago. And I met a friend who I went to school with, uh, who used to be an atheist, and Alhamdulillah, he became a Muslim, and then he went to uh, go study in Egypt, and he's there at the moment. And he said something very interesting to me, and I wanted your thoughts uh, on this. Um, so at the moment, um, he was telling me that being an atheist, a uh, former atheist, uh, he's very uh, uh, prized in Egypt because um, he can speak English, and obviously he's not Egyptian, and Egyptians love non-Egyptians. And also he's an, uh, an Islamic student of knowledge. Um, so he obviously deals with these sort of cases as well. But he said to me that the scholars of Egypt have said that when atheism came to Egypt in the 60s and the 70s and uh, so on, uh, the atheism through communism in the Arab world, that atheism had the same arguments as the atheism of Richard Dawkins and the latest atheism. Sure. But the difference is that that atheism didn't come with desires. It didn't come with pleasures. It didn't come with a sexual revolution or freedom. It didn't come with feminism. It came uh, with something quite dry, communism. Hence, it wasn't palatable. But he said the scholars of Egypt are now saying that the new atheism, which is uh, going through the world, it's the same argument, but it's way more potent because it's more desire-based. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, you can say that, actually. That's very, very obvious in Egypt because, actually, yeah, when it, when, when it first came to Egypt in the 60s, it was with communism and with the wave of communism. So most of those who started to adopt atheism were uh, old people or uh, people who are not very young. But today, <coughs> in the age of 14 and 15, you start... Yeah. You see people going publicly saying, I'm an atheist now. So yeah. it's more linked to, to, to that. I think atheism is a product of materialism. Absolutely. We see several phenomena in, 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 in the Arab world now. One of them is atheism. One of them is removing hijab. Yes, feminism. One of them, one of them is feminism. Radical feminism, not feminism. Radical feminism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all these things are linked to each other. Absolutely. And they're all the product of materialism. Mm, yep. So that's one of the reasons. Atheism in itself is a product of materialistic the material yep. way of thinking. Yep. Another thing, which is globalization. Kids who are in the houses in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Yemen are not really in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia or in Yemen. They are in a continent 
called the virtual continent. They are on the internet. Yes. So when they see the Muslim world undeveloped, yep. retarded, if they compare it to the West in politics, in economy, in justice, in many things, yep. they don't feel that they want to belong yep. to it. Yep. So they start rejecting every aspect of it. It's religion, it's language. You can see some kids in Egypt who speak English all the time. Yeah. And why do they do that? Okay, have they, have they been living abroad for a long time? You find that they never even saw a plane. They were always living in Why <laughs> are they speaking like that? And it's true. They only read English books. They only hear English songs. They only watch English films. What else? You know what? They even do not, um, uh, they are not fans of any uh, football team in Egypt. In, yeah. my, in, my, in my generation, yeah. Egyptian young people were either Muslim or Christian, Zamalkawi or Ahlawi. Either yeah, yeah. I am a fan of Zamalek or a fan of Ahli. That was like religion in Egypt. Today, you can easily find Egyptian young people who are neither promoting Ali or Zemek, they are for Real Madrid, they are for Arsenal, they are for Liverpool. So that's the issue. Why is that? Because they don't want to belong to this Ummah, not yes. even their football. It's not about religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, that's normal because the Ummah itself, the nation of the Islamic nation itself, is mm -hmm. underdeveloped now. Yeah. So why would a young person like to belong? I'll tell you something. I, listen, I'm, I'm very clear on these things, and I don't feel ashamed of saying the truth. <coughs> the nature of this religion, the religion of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that it is a religion that attracts young people and repels older people. That's what happened at the time of the Prophet sallallahu Yes, absolutely. When you see today the opposite happening, Young people are repelled and all the people are attracted, are attracted to it and sticking to it. Then you must understand that you are not presenting the religion of Muhammad. You are presenting a new religion that you have made up out of several aspects of culture. Some yes. Arabic culture, Indian culture, Malaysian culture. And you're mixing it with a flavor of Islam on it. And you're presenting it as Islam. That's not doing okay. Yeah. Okay, so so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, you're absolutely correct in terms of your sociological analysis of what's going on. But there are very well-known Muslim personalities, very well-known even here in uh, Pakistan and elsewhere outside, who they would totally disagree with you. They would say, we don't need to challenge atheism intellectually. Um, all we need to do is give people the pillars of Islam. Atheists are arrogant, forget them, just talk to the people about Quran and Sunnah. Uh, we need to do, um, amongst the Muslims, Muslims are not praying, so we need to just help them out. And they would challenge you, they would challenge you on this, and they would say, um, Islam is a religion in which we believe in Allah and His Messenger, and everything else is whispers of shaitan. We don't need to go into philosophy, we don't need to go into these things, you know. What, how would you respond to this? Okay, um... First of all, you reminded me that like uh, 20 years ago when I was in the US, I was invited to a presentation about Islam and the Muslim presenter gave non-Muslims a presentation called the five pillars of Islam. And I really hated that. Why are you telling people who don't believe in God and don't believe in Islam and don't believe in Prophet Muhammad what they need to do? that you have to fast Ramadan if you become Muslim, that you have to pay the guy. It's not a fact. The first thing you have to talk about is Tawheed, is yes. Allah, the existence of God, the attributes of God, the names of God. So I really don't understand how can uh, uh, scholars say that. I don't think those are scholars. <coughs> it's true that it is not our job. That's true, and I agree with that. It is not our job to convince people about the existence of God. It's not our job. It is the job of those who say that God does not exist to Absolutely. prove people. Yeah. I don't have to educate every Muslim how to prove the existence of God because this, this is logic. 
It goes yeah. without, without, without saying, without uh, saying. Yeah. But at the same time, if you see the number of messages I am receiving every day from people who say, I was an agnostic or I was an atheist. And when I saw or when I watched um, a, a, a one of your videos that refutes a, a shubha or a misconception, I return back to Islam, you would yeah. never see that. Absolutely. So see these messages and this feedback from people yes and by the way by the way in bridges we stopped even giving counseling sessions to atheists there are others who are doing that much better than us we yeah. are now dealing with something else with protection is more important than cure instead Absolutely. of curing people who already fell ill why don't we find the vaccine and we give it to them in a young age well, I want to ask you for something because you are playing the devil advocate and since the, it looks like the devil is draining my battery, I will in a second bring no my... Problem. Okay. No problem. No problem at all. So while, uh, while the Sheikh is away, I just want to go through some of the things that I didn't mention. He is the host of the Islamic show, a TV show in uh, uh, TV channel 30 in Washington metropolitan area. The host of Let the Quran Speak radio show in Washington, uh, the host of After Prayers, a TV show in Egypt, um, and a trainer who's trained over 9,000 Muslim youths in 25 countries on how to present Islam and how to refute misconceptions about Islam as well. And additionally to that, I just want to mention, he's got a master's degree in Islamic Sharia from the American Open University, diploma in Islamic studies from higher uh, Institute of Islamic Studies in Cairo 2006, Ijaza in Warsh, a narration of the Quran, studied Usul of Fiqh, Usul of Tafsir, uh, under the great scholars from Al Azhar, and his background is actually uh, in electronics and communication. He's also uh, published a number of works which include The Fog is Lifting, a series of documentaries on which Islam includes. Uh, which includes Islam in brief translated in 28 languages, uh, jihad, or terror uh, jihad on Terrorism, and Part 3, Islam in Women. The author and producer of Islamophobia, 120 TV episodes in English and Arabic languages, so on and so forth. Look, this link is going to be in the description, but I thought I'd go over some of those. So, Sheikh, while you're away, I was just going over some of the other things. But uh, could you continue from that point of the vaccine, uh, the, the point that you were making? Yeah. Uh, last year we announced a project called the protection of uh, children from atheism. And actually it started like when I sat with so many uh, uh, young people who left Islam, I found that most of the cases could have been avoided if certain uh, values were planted in their hearts from a young age. Mm -hmm. So I decided, I, it was always my dream that we can do something in educating children that makes them avoid atheists, but how can we do that? So I felt like to do that, we need to, um, to find the root causes of atheism. No. Because actually, you can protect a person from falling into extremism, for example, if you upbring him on moderation. If you implant in his heart moderate views. Okay, so Sheikh, 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 just before this, um, I know the, the program that you sent me over WhatsApp, we're going to go over that in detail. Mm -hmm. But you said something which I really want you to highlight here. You said that... Um, to challenge extremism and extremism being uh, obviously one of the causes of the issues that we face yeah. I just want you to tell us a story which I heard you relate previously online yeah. in which somebody did the feed of you when you were speaking out against atheism and you made a prediction that this man would apostate from Islam no, he did not make that a, a, a prediction he called me an apostate and he spat on my face in a yeah. public event in Denmark in the presence of the representative of the Queen of Denmark and yep. the representative of the Prime Minister and the existence of some ministers of the government and 600 people, half of them non-Muslim and the other half are Muslims, 
And because I said what happened on 9-11 cannot be justified in Islam, he spat on my face and he threw chairs and he called me Murtad. Murtad yeah. Today, I'm not an apostate, alhamdulillah, and he is an apostate. Yes, yes. So yes. what I believe is that extremism is not extra Islam. Extremism is the phase just before leaving Islam. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's all because of literalism, hyper-literalism. Yeah. I'll tell you something. Some people read some statements in the Quran or the Sunnah and they understand it literally and they go crazy doing terrorism. Yes. But also some people read some statements in the Quran and the Sunnah, like for example, that the sun after sunset goes and prostrates under the throne of, of Ar Rahman, of Allah, and they take it literally and they leave Islam and they go to atheism. Yeah. It's all about literalism. Yeah. Quran and Sunnah are in Arabic, so you have to respect the rules of Arabic yep. in order to understand them. And among the rules of Arabic is metaphors. Yeah. A lot of statements are metaphorical. Yeah. And that's the problem, that people want to deal literally with every word. The word is what it is, and there's no space for any uh, um, understanding. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to highlight something about that man who apostated from Islam. He had literally, because I've been watching his videos, uh, and you know, he's been on some news channels. Yeah. He's literally got no knowledge. He can't recite. I don't think he'll be able to recite Fatiha. And the funniest thing above all is when he apostated, a way of showing his apostasy was eating pork. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I really wanted to share this story to show that, um, you know, when you're speaking, and that's one of the one of the reasons why I invited you and I and I haven't invited, uh, say, somebody else is because you talk from experience. You don't talk about atheism or, or these types of issues from an abstract perspective. You've done on the ground work. Yeah. And I think that's extremely important to understand. So let's let's go into this vaccine. No, I, don't you know you know or not. I don't know if you know this or not. I uh, I have a, I, you know I studied uh, the Bible of Daesh, the Bible of um, uh, ISIS. Ibn State. I have uh, yeah. It's called it's called Fiqh al the the, uh, the 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 Fiqh of killings. Dema means uh, means blood. Yeah. And it's written by an Egyptian uh, person called Abdu Abu Abdullah Al-Muhajir, who is the Grand Mufti of Daesh. No one knows yeah. where he is now. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I studied it, and I refuted it in a lecture called uh, The ISIS Delusion. Yep. Nice I title. Have, I have a one, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a one-day workshop called How to De-Radicalize an Extremist. I gave it several times and I stopped giving it because I believe that governments don't want to end extremism. They don't want to end terrorism. So I, I, I felt like I'm wasting my time. And I decided to leave all that and focus on the Quran now mm -hmm. and protecting children. Yeah. That's all I'm doing right now. Okay. So before we get into the vaccine, because um, I'm definitely going to put the link of the video and, and the stuff that you're working on, I first want you to highlight how did you work out what are the causes of atheism and then relate that to the children's project? Okay. <coughs> first, of all, first of all, please forgive me for that cough. It's psychological. Because okay. I know that if I cough, people will think I have coronavirus. So I always have to... <laughs> It's very strange. Anyway. It's okay. It's okay. They'll make dua for you. It's fine. I down. I, 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 it's not only that I started talking to myself. I started... Differing with myself sometimes on some opinions. <laughs> <laughs> it, hap it happens at your age, Sheikh. It happens. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you. Uh, um, I said that if we find the, all the root causes of atheism, then all we need is to put the vaccine of every one of them, the, the, the antidote. But the issue is, how can we find all of them? Well, in 20 years, I sat with so many uh, atheists, so I have a good list. And in, Asia, in, in, in Bridges, we have other brothers also, like Dr. Ahmed Galal, who, said, who sits with many. So we had a, we, we compiled a good list, but that's not all. 
And then, uh, a couple of years ago, or three years ago, we, we sat in a committee uh, of people who are interested in doing that. And people, because I, at that time, I didn't have my papers finished in, in England yet, so I couldn't leave. So, you know what? They're very serious. They all came and they held the meeting in London because I can't travel. And that was very, I really appreciated that. They came all over, from all over the world, from Kuwait, from the United Arab Emirates, from Turkey, from everywhere, from, uh, from America. Many, several people came from America, from Jordan. And Brother Hamza Tsurtis. Me and him were from London. Ahmed Galal came from Manchester. Those yeah. are the two people who are from, from England. And also the Brother Shu'ib Malik and so on. So yeah. it was a very serious meeting that was held for about three days. And uh, we shared information. And before their planes leave from Heathrow Airport, I found that under my hand is like nearly every single root cause of atheism. Mm -hmm. That's that's a fortune. So what can I do? Yep. We made emergency, you know, in in uh, uh, in, uh, in in bridges, and we made a um, a committee of child psychiatrists and educators and myself. And we started finding the values that if they are planted in the mind and heart of a child, it will make him, it will make this root cause of atheism not work whenever the child is subjected to it in a later stage of life. Yep. yep. Let me give you an example, for example. Uh, for example, one of the root causes of atheism that, that came a lot, I've seen that a lot, is that Islam is an oppressive religion that oppresses women and LGBT people. And the one who leaves the religion because of that cause may not be a woman, may be a man, and may not be gay, may be straight. Straight man, and he leaves the religion because it's oppressive for women, or oppressive for LGBT, why? It's normal because no one likes to be a part of an oppressive system. Mm. So what can I do to a child in the age of seven to make this root cause neutralized when he faces or when he meets someone after 10 years in, in high school or in university who tells him Islam oppressed women? Okay, well, just a quick, just a quick yeah. question on that. Does this include people who get confused because of people like Muslims who get confused by ISIS, and they think is ISIS represents true Islam? Yes, yes, of course. This, this is, is one of the reasons, but that's not that's very rare, by the way. That's okay. very, everybody knows that it's propaganda, but there are other things that are more serious, like this one. No, yeah, yeah. Islam oppresses women, discriminates against women, discriminates against LGBT people. So the issue is, how, what can we? do to a child in the age of se seven are we going to talk him about sexuality mm -hmm. we are going to talk about sexuality and homosexuality to a child yeah. are we going to talk to him about the wisdom of allah behind the fiqh of uh, inheritance he's not yeah. going to do anything no. but we dealt with it already in the program that was launched recent i'm going to speak about it why Planting in the child mind that Islam oppresses is an oxymoron. There is nothing like as a so-called Islam oppresses. Yep. Actually, Islam came to remove oppression. Yes. And he the, the child learns about an ayah, um, a, a sign, one of the signs of uh, the Quran in Surah Al-Hadid, Surah number 57, in which Allah says. And indeed, I have sent all my messengers, Muhammad, Isa, Musa, Nuh, all of them, Ibrahim, all of them, with miracles and books, Quran, the Torah, Injil, all of these books, so that people may uphold justice. Yes. yes. All the messengers, all the books, to remove oppression and to uphold justice. So when you are implanting this in the heart and mind of a child, after 10 years, 
when he meets a jackass somewhere in any university who tells him Islam oppressed, he's not going to continue listening to him. Mm. So like that. So the issue is, we found the antidotes and the values that and principles that should be implanted in the kids' hearts and minds. But how can we do that? You know what? I uh, filmed, and then I watched myself. I said, never will any child watch <laughs> looks like Santa Claus talking about something very uninteresting for him. So you know what I did? I tried to look younger, so I, I dyed my hair brown. You should see the video. I, I, I filmed again. Looks like someone in, in, in the age of 70 who wants to marry an 18-year-old <laughs> who tries to look younger, but it's so funny. <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I started anyway at that time. I started trying these uh, principles on kids physically by giving, giving wor physical workshops to kids. So I went to a city called Bristol and I sat with 100 kids, giving them a, a workshop, one-to-one. -one. Or I'm giving them a workshop, I mean. It's not, 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 not watching videos. And there they told me, one of the kids who's here, he's 11, loved you so much, he knows by heart all your Islamophobia series in Arabic oh, okay. English. He can say oh, them by heart. And even your Arabic showed Dhikr uh, uh, because the kid is Egyptian who lives in, in, in England. I said, that's exactly what I need. Let me see the boy. And you know what? He filmed the material that I prepared. MashaAllah. Very challenging. But we found that the best way is to do that. Say yeah. after me in the same tone. And I say the phrase, and he says it to the camera in the same tone. And then I say the phrase, and he says to him, and then we cut, 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 Father Solomon, and it's only there. Ahmed, or his name is um, Ahmed Muhammad Salah. He's very, he's very confident. Yes. Yeah, mashallah. And, and, okay, how can I make sure that when Sabur uh, subscribes in that program for his child, that his child will really digest the meanings that I want him to digest from every video. Hmm. He made them very short videos, two minutes, but still, how can I know? So after every video, there are four or five questions that, that uh, emphasize the points that I want to make sure that the child have digested. Okay, hmm. still, how can I make sure that when Sabur subscribes for his child that your child will watch 15 videos and answer 60 or 75 questions. Mm -hmm. There is no workshop. It's a game. When Savur subscribes, he subscribes in a game. And your son goes on a boat and he starts recycling the plastic bags that are killing turtles in the sea. And then when the fuel runs out, he goes to a port to refuel. The first question is, would you like to put solar energy fuel, clean fuel, clean energy, or benzene or diesel? And then a character called Barbarossa appears and tells him, wait, if you choose solar energy, you are saving the environment and you will get double points because he saved 100 turtles. So he has like 100 points when he entered. They will become double, 200. And yep. then the second question is about the video that he watched. The, the, and if he answers the video right from the first time, he gets double points again. So answering the, watching the video uh, attentively and answering the questions the right way gives him more points. He leaves the port with a full tank and 16,000 points after he entered with 100 because Allah is generous. MashaAllah. Man is generous. And then he continues on a new map, saving turtles and so on between islands and so on. Like that, he watches 15 videos, implanting in his heart 15 to 20 different principles. And he answers questions. And then he, because he sees that the scorer of the month is a girl from Canada. She scored 
75,200 points and he has 75,000 only. He was so close to become the scorer of the month. So he plays the game again and watches the videos again and answers the questions again. Mashallah. Like that, you are engraving in the hearts of minds of kids mm. principles. Some people may say that's very immoral. Leave kids to find out. You are indoctrinating kids. Okay? Yeah. And this is not indoctrinating kids. <laughs> Atheism for kids. Huh? <laughs> not indoctrination for kids. Humanism for kids. One moment. Uh, yeah, such double standards. Yeah. How to live without a God for kids. And the first page, when they open, they see who is a humanist. His name is Daniel Radcliffe, the... Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yeah. So everyone has the right to teach his kids whatever he wants. And we so, have the right to protect our kids from. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Sheikh, uh, what's interesting is I tried to work out. You see, Richard Dawkins, yeah. he's moved his entire narrative to children now. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a book called Outgrowing God. He's got another book uh, called um, The Magic of Reality. And I went, when I went through The Magic of Reality, I basically was really shocked because a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, he was telling me that his uh, sister, she teaches in a school. And in that school, and this is a school in London, the school teachers are talking about this book, right? Because it's so accessible for children. So when an atheist wants to promote atheism, yeah, it's, it's fine, no problem. But when a Muslim wants to uh, do the same thing, they, you know, they, they, they lose their hair. So I want to ask you this question: Why do you think? Why do you think it is that um, the children are the future? That and, and that's basically where we need to focus on. Uh, obviously, within the legal framework, but in terms of our literature, why is why is that uh, so important? Definitely, because children are our future. You just said it. If we don't quickly focus on teaching this generation what Islam is really all about, this can be the last generation of Islam. Mm. They have to understand that mm. most people are indoctrinating them. And we have the right also to educate them. And at the end, la ikraha fi deen. You know la ikraha fi deen descended upon Prophet Muhammad it's, it's It's an ayah that says, let there be no compulsion in religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. It's an ayah that was sent down to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to defend the right of Jewish young people to stay Jews and not to be oppressed by their Muslim fathers to become Muslim. Yes, yes, yes. That's amazing. Yep. When the Quran comes to defend Jewish youth, leave them yep. alone. Why force anyone to become Muslim? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have a question for you regarding this. Um, yes, I do see that we need to focus on the youth. Uh, we need to focus on the young uh, minds and, and give them these concepts. But I'll give you a case scenario that I dealt with here in Pakistan. Uh, there's a young man that I met who he apostated from Islam and he became Muslim. By the time I met him, he was already Muslim. But he said to me his reason for apostating was that he was 15. And he basically wanted to get a girlfriend. He didn't want to, you know, be confined by the laws of Islam. So your approach is, 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 is devastating against atheism intellectually. But how do we deal with those desire-based causes of atheism? Good. The problem is that we keep criticizing Christians, but we are following their footsteps in everything. Christians <laughs> say, you cannot be a Christian and do that. No, in Islam, you can be a Muslim and do sins. But you are still Muslim. Yes. So, yes. yeah, terrorists uh, can be Muslim terrorists. And this doesn't make them non-Muslim. Because in Islam, we don't believe that, that, all, that Muslims will go to uh, paradise. No, many Muslims. Listen, ask any Muslim in the street, are you going to paradise? He cannot guarantee that. But in Christianity, you're a Christian, you are saved. In Islam, you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you're not saved yet. <laughs> mm. You have to do the good work. 
and you do yeah. things, you can go to hellfire. That's fine. So the issue yeah. is <coughs> we, we have to stop telling people, you cannot be a Muslim and have a girlfriend. No, we tell them it's wrong in Islam to have a girlfriend. But we should not say you have to leave Islam if you want to have a girlfriend. You have to leave Islam if you want to gamble. No, he doesn't have to leave Islam. Yeah, no, I, he has to understand that it's a sin. And Allah said, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutawabin. Those who repent frequently, it means that they also sin frequently. So you absolutely. Sin, absolutely. If you, sin, you have to repent and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is also important because we believe anybody that says la ilaha illallah, they will eventually go to paradise. Yeah, regardless of how sinful they were. And I want to tell you a story of why somebody that I know, they became a Christian from being an atheist and not a Muslim. And I want to, I want you to comment on the story. So this man, I met him uh, and he was uh, a student at Oxford University and he was an atheist, a militant atheist. And he used to regularly watch pornography. And when he watched pornography, he felt evil. He felt bad. Yeah. And he said, I converted to Christianity to feel better. And that's why I'm Christian. Now, Sheikh, if you tell him that the, the Bible is not preserved, do you know what his answer is? He says, I know. Anything you give him. But Christianity is a religion that's been promoted as salvation for everybody, eventually. And God is loving and forgiving. And Islam by Muslims has been, you are not a Muslim unless you are like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, this particular Sahaba or that particular Sahaba. There's a perfectionism. There's a perfection. So people think either perfectionism or I'll be a kafir. That's, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? If, if you ask anyone who commits crimes, would you like to live in a state of law or a, a, a lawless state? He would choose a lawless state. So Christianity doesn't really have a law. If you're a, cry, a Christian, you are saved and God forgives everything, everything. And just believe in him. Mm. So it's definitely, it's definitely much more comfortable than Islam. But mm. the question is, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> or are you bluffing yourself? And you are crashing into a tree now. Actually, yeah. after you die, you discover that that wasn't true. Yeah, no, so, no, I want you to clarify something. You are correct, of course, that Christianity has this idea that you're saved regardless. But what I was trying to emphasize is that it's the fault of the Muslims that we haven't told people that, look, a sinful Muslim is better than a kafir because a sinful Muslim will still go to paradise eventually. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Uh, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. ultimately. And um, in Speaker's Corner, this is probably going to surprise you, but we have Egyptian Christians that come mm -hmm. and they come and they confuse people and they, you know, they pretend they were ex-Muslims and all this type of stuff. But one underlying message that they give, which is very surprising uh, that it's working, is that Islam is a religion that you have to be perfect to enter paradise and Christianity is a religion in which paradise is for everybody and that is very attractive. Okay, I'll tell you something because I also used to give counseling for people who left Islam to Christianity and I have a uh, two, uh, uh, I have a video called the missionary's deception. Uh, I had two cases of girls who left Islam to Christianity. And I found when I sat with them that both of them sinned and they committed fornication with a Christian boy. And what I realized, what was common between the two girls is that they were not beautiful at all. Very far from beautiful. And I found that in both cases, that's what happened. A boy pretended to be in love. After sleeping with the girl, he cried and he said, oh my God, I sinned. And he, he made her cry as well because he started to show remorse. And he said, but in our religion, Jesus said, the one who is without a sin should throw her with a stone. Yeah, but yeah. Your religion, you are doomed. So she found that the only salvation for her is in that religion that is okay with a fornicator. Absolutely. So this is how sneaky they can be sometimes.
Hmm. That's why we have to explain to our children things in their, in the, and give them the real weight. You cannot give the weight of a sin, no matter how big the sin is, the same weight of kufr. Absolutely. You have to, yeah. And that's what actually destroyed other religions. Mixing the weights of things. Number one is the Quran. Number two is the Sunnah. The Sunnah is never like the Quran. You understand me? After the Sunnah comes the Ijma'ah. After that comes the opinions of the scholars. But in other religions, when people gave the same weight for everything, the religion was lost. Okay, so this is a price list. That's what I like about Dr. Khaladawi's uh, expression. There's a price list in Islam. Not everything has the same price. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I wanted to highlight something here that um, I was talking to a scholar from the UK and he said the way that even students of knowledge, they go around teaching Islam, they teach people about the, the mannerisms of knowledge as if these people are living at the time of the Salaf when these are just regular people off the street. And you're teaching them about abstract stuff about, you know, people in the past, they were like this, they were like this. And, you know, Numan Ali Khan says about this, that this creates a mindset that um, because I'm not perfect, might as well just give up. I mean, Islam is so difficult because everybody has to be like the Sahaba or the Salaf or, or like, uh, you know, these people. I know people here who don't really pray Isha because it's 17 rak'ahs. And I'm tired always when I come back. Now, who took the shaykh? But that's what they learned because their scholars who taught them want them to pray all the sunan. So they don't tell them which is far and which is sunnah so that they can pray all. But what they what they don't know is that sometimes they will also leave all. Hmm. And I'll tell you something because I have a friend here yep. who is um, always giving the very strict opinions, very strict. And I gave the lenient opinion. And when we met, uh, I told him, where do you think you are leading people to? Paradise or hellfire like that? Yep. I paradise. I said, no, believe me. When you give only the very strict opinion and you don't tell the young people is that there is an easier opinion that you don't uh, embrace, but you don't tell them about it. Yep. Don't think that everyone will do what you said. Some of them will do the other option thinking that it is haram. And you are giving him more guts to do the haram. No, tell him that what he is doing, there's an opinion that allows it. It's much better for him than doing this, thinking that it's haram. while well, it is okay and in some other people, never. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think this type of extremism, um, it, it makes atheism more attractive because atheism fundamentally, and I've made a previous video about this, if you're living a life with the Nike slogan, just do it. Yeah. If you're mm -hmm. living a life with a slogan of uh, yeah. do what you follow your heart, do what you desire. Atheism is the easiest conclusion for you because atheism, anything goes. Islam has things which restrict your desire. Yeah. Now, those things are good for you. But when you make it so much more difficult, then people, they think, look, might as well, I'm young, might as well try things out, which is why I've met people that in their young age, they're attracted towards this atheism stuff, but then afterwards they realize it's all nonsense. Yeah. But it's the, it's, it's the desire which really gets to them. The, the, I believe that the real danger this is, is not atheism. So, so you say that again? The real danger is not atheism. It yep. is humanism. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Carry on. It's humanism, yes. It's humanism. Uh, atheism is a nihilistic uh, approach, but humanism is positive. Okay, they say, okay, I don't care if you have a God or not, if there's God or not. I exist, and the human being exists. And this is what we are sure of. And the human being himself became a God. And that's why I want to discuss this with you. I'm thinking that after this coronavirus pandemic happened, and the lockdown of all people on earth and the lockdown of every aeroplane on earth like that. We need a new rhetoric that speaks more and highlights more the, the, uh, the might of God, how mighty God is and how weak the human being is. And can the human being be 
a god really? Because in humanism, the human being is the god. Yeah, uh, Sheikh, subhanallah, that is a really, really powerful narrative. And it reminds me of an American brother who contacted me just a few days ago. And he was looking into Islam for a long time. But when the coronavirus got really bad, he basically messaged Aira and then I messaged him back and he said, I need to take my Shahada. I need to become Muslim because um, I was looking into Islam before, but right now it really rattled him. It really it put fear in him. Yeah. Definitely. And and even right now, atheists, they're, they're not as loud as they were before. The arrogance, you know, is, is, is sort of going. No, no, Arab atheists on Twitter are writing, well, religious guys, can you please pray? <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really amazing and I, I said in one of my episodes about the Dabur of Quran that had there been a book in the future from Allah after the Quran which is not going to happen but just imagine this what we are what is happening now would have definitely been taking a big space in that book Telling people about this ayah, this sign, we are living a sign of Allah. That if there had been, if there would be, if there would be another book from Allah, it would have definitely mentioned us in it. And all people on earth were locked down. That's not a punishment from Allah because the punishment of Allah is not that light. <laughs> yes, definitely. But it's a sign from Allah. Oh it's yes. A huge sign. So, Sheikh, Sheikh um, just before, I want to touch on two more topics before we end, inshallah. The first topic is, um, in 2016, I was attending your lecture at uh, East London Mosque where you're doing the names of Allah. Oh. And you you yeah. made a distinction, uh, which um, I... Yes, darling. The little boy has to come in okay. your house tomorrow. Okay. You speak Urdu. Why are you speaking uh, English in Pakistan? Uh, the thing is, I moved from uh, England to Pakistan. My daughter is learning Urdu. She doesn't know it yet. <laughs> so um, basically, in that lecture in ELM, what you basically said, I'm summarizing, but if I've said, if I've paraphrased you wrong, please correct me, Sheikh. So you said about um, people say, why is somebody punished for such a short life? They're punished for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And you gave the example uh, that Allah has four types of knowledge. Allah has knowledge of past, present, future, and potential. Potential meaning what would happen if it happened, if anything was different. And then you gave the Quranic verse that um, if somebody uh, somebody's going to go to hellfire, and then they will say to Allah, oh Allah, send me back. I will do good, but then that person, he will do evil again. So you well, made know, a false... Mm. Yeah, so no, you made the false... Yeah. Yeah, you made the false distinction about um, Allah's knowledge in terms of Allah knows all potential trajectories. And Alhamdulillah, since then I've been using it in the da'wah. But there's a question here I wanted you to address, which is this. If it's the case that, <laughs> if it's the case that, you know, um, Allah knows the every single trajectory and Allah knows this will happen at this time and this will happen at this time, why is it important that somebody who we may feel, and Allah may know this, that they will never accept Islam, right? Like Fir'aun. Why is it that we still need to convey the message of Islam to them? And this is especially important because many of the people who are watching this channel, we sometimes deal with the most vile, the most hateful atheists that you could safely bet, chances are they probably will never come to Islam. Right, but why is it still important, even though we know they don't want to accept it, that we still give them the message? Okay, first of all, brace yourself. Sarawan came to Islam and he said, But he was rejected because it was too late. You can't wait until your last breath and say, I'm, I'm Muslim. And he said, He said, I believe. In what the sons of Israel believed in, and I am a Muslim. Mm. Now, now after being a, a, a defiant or disobedient like that, so that's the issue. Second, why is dua 
y, y, uh, y, uh, y uh, uh, a, a worship, a, a ritual of worship. If what's going to happen is going to happen. Hmm. Why was Prophet Zechariah making dua to Allah to give him a son in a very old age and his wife became very old and always have been barren all her life? Mm. And he was given the good news that she is becoming pregnant. He was shocked. So why was he doing dua until yesterday? Mm, yeah. It is our duty to do da'wah. And it is our duty to make dua. And it's our duty. First of all, you do not ask someone who does not exist. So when you make dua to Allah, you are confirming in your heart that he exists. And when you ask Allah something very far from happening, like giving you a son in a hundred years, <coughs> you're a hundred years old and your wife is 90 years old and barren, then definitely you are saying to Allah, you are great and I'm asking something great, even if you don't want it, if you don't even expect it to happen. But it's mm. a ritual of worship. And mm. among your tasks as the Khalifa of Allah on earth is to give da'wah everywhere mm. and to everyone. Mm. That's the issue. That's the issue. But mm. the issue here is, and what the question that always comes to me is, if Allah knows what is going to happen, why is he allowing this to, to happen? I mean, how can he hold us accountable when he himself uh, uh, knows what is going to happen in the future. Why did he even create us? Does does he like putting people, to torturing people in hell? That, mm. That's the question. And that's a very good question. Allah's knowledge does not affect your decisions. You are a, a very, uh, you are a peculiar uh, a creature who is not programmed yep. but other creatures do not have a free will so yep. for example uh, because the question is why didn't Allah create us all good he could have created us all good yeah good like who like donkeys donkeys are all good have you ever seen a donkey even uh, attacking another animal donkeys are always nice and kind and carrying anything on them and, and why because they don't have a, a free will free Yep. We have a free will. Part and parcel of having a free will is that some of us will choose the wrong choices. Yes. Some of us will choose the, the evil, to do evil. So yep. if Allah programs us to always do good, then we become like donkeys. We become like robots. Let's not yep. say this so that people don't take it as an insult. Robots. We are not robots. Mm. God knows what is going to happen in the future. And he even knows the fourth thing, which is, what will not happen if it happens how it would happen yep. but knowledge does not affect your choices and i'll give yes. you an example like a good teacher who has good experience with his students can tell you two months before the examination who will pass and who will not and the more knowledgeable he is the more expert he is with his ch 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 students the more he can tell you who will get an A, who will be an A student, and who will be a C student. Absolutely. We cannot blame the teacher for those who failed, because yep. it was completely their responsibility, even if he knew, even if he knew about it. Yep. It's true that the teacher predicts, and Allah does not predict, but this shows you that there is some type of knowledge that does not affect decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, this is a very simple, uh, a simple answer. And it, it, this is something which I learned from Muhammad Hijab when he was debating some atheists, is that the same problem exists for atheists, predestination and qadr. I mean, free will, it doesn't even exist. The only problem is that they don't have a solution and we have a solution. Now, I want you to touch upon one more thing because we usually do this session for about an hour and we're definitely going to have you again for a few more sessions during this lockdown because you won't really be able to use the excuses of uh, traveling around giving talks. Um, so I want to ask you this question. I had an atheist, uh, a former atheist on this channel a few days ago who accepted Islam, alhamdulillah, and uh, uh, he, he gave this very interesting story and I wanted you to comment on it. So he said that when he was a militant atheist, and previous to this, he was like a Christian. 
And growing up in, in the UK, obviously you, you, you have a very negative image of Islam anyway. So he said when he first read the Quran as an atheist, he read it and according to him, he was arrogant. He did not want to have guidance. He was looking to refute the Quran. He said, when I read the Quran, it was exactly what I thought, just an ancient book of, you know, like fables, nothing. But he said later on, when I, many, uh, uh, many months or years later, whenever, when I started looking into religion seriously and I started asking for guidance and I read the Quran, this time with humbleness, this time without arrogance, this time looking for guidance, he said, I thought I was reading a new book I've never read before, totally different. Yes. So can you give us evidence for this in Islam that you have to approach the Quran with the right attitude? It's not about abstract proof. It is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 26. Indeed, Allah does not shy away from setting forth any parable, even of a gnat, which is like a small mosquito. Um, where is it? Okay. Um, or anything above it. So it's like a, a, an ambiguous parable that we don't understand. So as for those who have attained faith, the believers, they know that it is the truth from their Lord, though they don't understand, but they have confidence in their Lord that there is wisdom, even if we don't know it yet. But as for those who have denied the kuffar, okay? They say, <laughs> what did Allah want to say by this parable? He, Allah, misguides many thereby and he guides many thereby. Allah so, Akbar. Who misguides them because their approach is that they want to make fun of the Quran. You want to make fun of the Quran? Take some things and make fun of it. Take Alif Lam Mim, go make two episodes. Take Kaf Haya Insad. They call us Kahayas people. By the way, <laughs> no one do that. So the Quran himself will misguide you. And the Quran himself can guide you. The Quran, the Quran has the power to misguide as it has the power to guide. It's all about the approach of the reader. Allah if you approach it politely and you want to learn, it will guide you and give you a lot of guidance. If you want Allah. it impolitely, approach it impolitely, it will really misguide you. It's up to you. Yes. That, that's a beautiful, beautiful story to end upon. I'm going to be releasing this video in Ramadan now. So I want you to give the viewers... Uh, just some quick nasiha about Ramadan as we're approaching Ramadan. Uh, something, especially during this lockdown, which I don't think has ever happened uh, in in our lifetimes, or, or even the lifetimes of our, our uh, you know, the people who are grandparents that they had the Ramadan like this. What would your advice be, Sheikh? Quran, Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Shahr Ramadan, al unzila fi al Quran." But, uh, so Allah said, <coughs> the, the month of Ramadan is the month in which Ramadan was descended. So it is the month of the Quran. Please ponder upon the Quran, even if you don't know Arabic. I have a playlist on YouTube that is called How to Ponder the Quran, even if you don't know Arabic. It gives you key points. We know about many people who were not Muslim. They read the Quran and they became Muslim. Actually, they did not read the Quran. They read the translation. That is like 60, 70, 80% accurate. But still, in the translation of the Quran, in Urdu, in English, there is guidance. So don't deprive yourself of that. You have to read at least for three, four hours every day with pondering. But how to ponder? I really, really wish that you attend this workshop, which is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's called How to Ponder the Quran Even If You Do Not Know Arabic. And put my name next to it, Father Soliman. You will yep. get my channel. Subscribe to my channel. Absolutely, and I'm going to put the, that in the description, uh, how to approach the Qur'an. I came across this, I think, two years ago, mm -hmm. and um, we'd like to definitely thank you for uh, attending today's session, mm -hmm. and uh, I really am I'm happy that you're in high spirits, you're doing well, and you have this great vaccination project, which mm -hmm. is, uh, inshallah, going to be rolled out at the same time that we'll have the vaccine, the real vaccine as well, <laughs> inshallah, for this particular problem. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. May Allah preserve you. May Allah make you and your family enter Jannah together. Right. And thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum.